Welcome back to DC Thursday. I'm Pete Soderling. I'm the founder of Data Council and the Data Community Fund. And I'm your guide through the modern data ecosystem, which is expanding and growing at an amazing clip. Uh, we just had our Data Council in Austin last month, and we had 600 of the top professionals in the space, dozens of startups, dozens of investors, and it was amazing to get everyone together again. So it was proof to us that there's no lack of interest in the space. And as you know, um, every other week or so, we bring you an amazing personality who's working either on an open source project or some data tech or a startup. Um, and today is no exception. We have Jeremy Stanley with us, who is the CTO and co-founder of Anomalo. Uh, Jeremy was previously the VP of data science at Instacart. And uh, prior to that, he was also at Sailthrough and Collective in New York City, um, which is where we met. So Jeremy, I wanna welcome you to the show. Thank you, Pete. So excited to be here. Really looking forward to this conversation. I think it was probably 10 or so years now that we've, that we've met um, when you were in New York. And I, th I think, I'm not sure if it was collective or sail through one of the two, but um, you were working on data. I mean, even before um, running data at sail through, you were working as a CTO at collective, which is a meaningful ad tech company in New York and ad tech companies, as anyone who's been an engineer in New York city knows, uh, always had like meaningful scale and sort of interesting data challenges. Um, even before the term data engineering was a thing, there were ad tech companies who basically had data engineering like practices because of all the data that you had. So I'm curious to, maybe we should start there. And, um, you know, how did that sort of impact your career and, um, impact your appreciation of what the challenges behind data scale really meant. Yeah, so you know, I actually I started my career in data twenty years ago, which dates me. Um, mm. And you know, I I graduated from school yeah, around the year two thousand, and there you know was no good job opportunities as the bubble had burst. I was studying math. I knew I wasn't going to be one of the best math professionals, right? One of the best math professors, and so I wanted to go into an applied domain. And I convinced an insurance company to hire me and that convinced myself that maybe I'd become an actuary. I took several tests and I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to spend a whole career studying the insurance domain. And I convinced the company that hired me that we could use data to make better underwriting decisions for life insurance. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I had a few textbooks. I really didn't understand databases. I was trying to code everything myself in C++. It was a nightmare, it was a mess, but I learned a tremendous amount and I ended up moving to New York after that from Kansas. And I spent the first five years of my career in financial services uh, using data to build models to predict behavior of you know, uh, different, different entities. It could be um, medical malpractice claims for physicians or you know, the chance that a coal mine was going to collapse and cause a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and so really generally smaller data sets there, but really cutting my teeth on how do you effectively use data and what are all of the different ways that you can get stuck there, right? Ranging from you know, overfitting to data quality issues to you know, not, not effectively measuring what it is you're actually trying to accomplish. Um, so I, I saw the ad tech ecosystem burgeoning in New York. I knew that data was massive and there was a huge opportunity to, to begin to optimize advertising, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of things were very, very simple. You know, retargeting worked well using mm. data with no real optimization, but beyond that, there wasn't much. And so I jumped into ad tech um, and really had to figure out how to build the, the modern data stack you know, for deploying machine learning and analytics apps you know, before the modern data stack existed. You know, buying many millions of dollars worth of hardware mm -hmm. you know, in and data centers and uh, duct, duct taping and gluing things together to, to build products and, and to differentiate. And so it was fun to be able to kind of build these things from the ground up and see all of the pain. Um, and then now to see the whole ecosystem just making so much, so many things easier, right? Now one person can accomplish what, you know, 50 people uh, would, have, would have been required to do, you know, five or 10 years ago. It's amazing. Yeah, isn't that true? So you were probably building early data in uh, at Collective in what, 2009 or, or so? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and so we were using Hadoop extensively. We were using uh, Netiza as you know a hardware uh, MPP system that predated you know Redshift and then Snowflake and BigQuery. Um, 
Yeah. Yep, got it. Um, well, that's that's fascinating, and yeah, you, you've been in it a long time. Um, so, so then, when you moved to sail through, um, what were the big data challenges at sail through? Well, the funniest one was that sail through was built on top of Mongo, um, and right. that was, you know, fascinating experience and opportunity. You know, Mongo allowed the engineers to write arbitrary you know uh, uh, features without having to worry about the data model. They could just log whatever JSON they wanted into Mongo. Um, and that could evolve over time uh, as they were you know, adding new features. And so it was actually really challenging to figure out how to build you know, reliable pipelines on top of a data model that could change at any moment and had changed you know, hundreds of times without you know, a lot of kind of you know, care or thought over the course of, of, mm -hmm. of the company. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, we were using Spark then. Um, and started using you know data warehouses like Redshift, uh, but mm -hmm. a lot of the challenges was how to deal with that unstructured data. Mm -hmm. And was this decision made? I mean, Salesforce was an email marketing company early on. Was the was it just because they wanted to store sort of email content documents? Like they, they felt like their their business was about documents, therefore Mongo made sense. Or was there some other um, analysis that that went into that decision? Well, Salesforce was fundamentally about personalizing email. So there were already you know, email platforms that predated sale through and they were very difficult to personalize. And so sale through began with transactional email, right? You, you are trying to do something about your account and you want a confirmation you know, for that account change. It needs to be very personalized and detailed to your specific profile and the actions that you took. Mm. And so the primary document was all of the information around the user and their activity um, with, with the actual you know, publishing or product brand that had the relationship with the customer. So they could put arbitrary the customers. So you've got like hundreds of publishers, you know, business insider, right? Big media publishers or, or really large uh, e-commerce brands piping in arbitrary data about their users in uh, JSON format as documents into, into Mongo and then using that to, to trigger campaigns and activities through email. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. So from there, you moved west um, to the Bay Area, and you ended up as VP Data Science at Instacart, which I've always thought of as a, a quite a you know, data forward um, type of company, considering um, scale, considering logistics, considering all the things that it takes to sort of deliver a, a high quality service um, mm -hmm. to, to a broad set of individuals or, or customers. Um, what were some of the main things that you learned at, at Instacart? Yeah, I think one thing to realize about Instacart is that it's the kind of business where it doesn't work without data and machine learning. You just, you can't mm. do that business. You can't do Instacart without mobile phones, right? With shoppers using those mm -hmm. mobile phones in order to be able to go out and pick the groceries. You also can't do it without data. It's impossible to have the right shopping experience for consumers when you know, they're trying to reflect the inventory available at every retail store location. Mm and whether or not that's gonna be found on the shelves mm. at that store location and you know, provide a great shopping experience digitally. And it's impossible to effectively route and utilize an on-demand you know, shopping workforce in a way that is gonna be efficient for the business and you know, uh, uh, efficient for the shoppers themselves and you know, keep the shoppers happy without using a tremendous amount of data. So data was in their DNA, a poor of the founder you know, was an engineer at Amazon working on logistics and mm. you know, knew that data was foundational. And the first hires were very, very focused on getting the data right. And so I think it was interesting to see at Instacart this you know, multi-sided marketplace where they could collect data about so many activities, right? You know, down to you know, the second uh, geolocation of a shopper's phone inside of a grocery store, picking an item with a specific SKU, right? All of this very granular data, um, all being captured, stored in a cloud data warehouse. And then everybody at Instacart had access to the data and most people at Instacart were fluent in SQL and could go mm. in and write SQL queries, use the data to make decisions, to build products. Mm. Um, and so the, the data fluency and connectivity there was incredibly high. Uh, and then the other thing that I really loved about Instacart was the, the bias for action and for ownership. You know, in the past, I always felt like once I'd moved into the startup world that, oh, startups, they move so much faster than corporations or consultants. And then I got to Instacart and I was like, oh, wait a second. I thought they moved faster, but no, Instacart is setting a completely different bar for mm -hmm 
you know, an idea exists on Monday and it's in production on Friday. Mm. Um, you know, and that's the expectation. Anytime anything is proposed, it's how do we do it faster? How do we learn faster? And I think a big part of why that was the case is because it was such a complicated system. You know, it's this, you can't do anything at Instacart without affecting five or six different key metrics, right? It could be, does the customer get their groceries on time? Do they get the actual grocery items that they want? Um, you know, how big is the basket? Uh, how fast is a shopper able to pick the groceries? How fast is the delivery? Are the shoppers kept utilized? Uh, are the shoppers happy with their experience? Mm. You could imagine many changes that could happen in that platform and they would have multiple effects in those metrics, right? Three might get positive, one might come negative. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the need to be able to instrument, monitor, conduct rigorous A-B tests, you know, A-B tests at times where like, we're gonna change how the routing algorithm works randomly by day, by city, and do an A-B test at the day city level with you know, statistics on top of that to control for the variation. It was pretty wild. You know, figuring mm -hmm. out what mm -hmm. the implications of your changes were was so difficult and challenging, and data was such a huge part of that. Mm. And I, I, I never thought of this connection before, but it almost feels to me like the culture of A-B testing um, sort of predates a lot of our um, heavy reliance and dependence on analytics, product analytics and things. Like, um, I feel like that was sort of the, what, what, what broke the seal on many companies understanding the power of being quote data driven. Um, and this is before we had significant probably advancements in CDPs or um, other kinds of product analytics, um, let alone, you know, having data scientists on staff. No one had data scientists on staff um, when they had, I mean, maybe the first data scientist they got was to actually sort of analyze A-B testing results or help a, help a product team sort of properly instrument A-B testing in a statistically valid way. And um, I, I never, never really dawned on me that that was almost maybe a, a precursor um, to a lot of the modern um, data analytics and, and BI that we're doing now. Obviously, we had BI, but sort of not in a statistically meaningful way before A-B testing. Would you agree? Yeah, so I would say it's the strongest relationship is actually the enablement of machine learning. Mm. Um, you know, there are lots of product changes that you can make that you can A-B test. A lot of things that it's actually very difficult to A-B test. You have to, you have, to have you know, some conviction and move the product in a new direction and, and go for it, right? And use, use kind of intuition or first principles thinking to do it. But machine learning, I think you can, you can really make rapid progress if you can mm. set up rigorous A-B testing on the metrics that matter. Mm. Um, and it's shocking to me how often um, at Instacart or in other places in my career, you can build an amazing machine learning model that back tests incredibly powerfully, right? Is very good at making recommendations that you know, people would go on to consume or to you know, predicting the outcome of behavior. And then you put that into production in some you know, seemingly obvious way and A-B test results are terrible. Mm. because of unintended consequences. Um, mm. And it's a feedback loop, right? These, these, these machine learning models don't go into a static system. They change the system. Mm. Um, and so you know, I'll give you an, a, a fun example. We built a model to predict the sequence with which shoppers should pick the groceries. And we ordered mm. the items in the app according to that sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you did that in a way that would minimize the traveling distance that the shopper should go through, it was a terrible change hmm. because often it's not, it would have them go to the frozen aisle first, which no one does. And they would look at it and they would go, this doesn't make any sense. These groceries aren't going to be cold by the end of the end, end of the trip. They would disregard hmm. the whole list and now be confused about how to navigate. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, the kind of the, the, the real world implications of the change and the feedback loops and, and what does it actually mean is, is so important. Um, and so if you can set up really strong A-B tests, it gives you that ground truth and allows you to take a lot more risk with data upstream. Yeah, that's fascinating. That, that's a good example. Um, well, before we get into um, Anomalo and some of the, the, the lessons that you know, drove you to start that company, um, I want to take a little detour because um, you've been one of the tech leaders that I've always appreciated um, for your writing. And... Mm -hmm. Um, you actually just published a blog post um, how we shouldn't be talking about data warehouses. We should be talking about data factories, which is um, fascinating, a fascinating read and um, getting a lot of good play in the ecosystem. So I'd recommend that um, folks check that out. Um, but 
you know, throughout your career, you've sort of, you, you've been a great community member of Beta Council because you've always been such a prolific speaker and author and writer. And um, I was uh, reflecting that your time at Instacart was no different. And, you know, there are many, many blog posts that you and the Instacart team um, generated to expose sort of the cool projects and things that you were working on. And I just wanted to ask you, um, how did you get your team members to write? Because it can be really hard to get technical people to do that. So I'm wondering if you have any, any tricks or lessons, because I think that a lot of companies in our community aspire to do more, quote, content marketing, um, you know, in an authentic sort of helpful way, because their teams have so much embedded knowledge to share, but I think it's hard to get the ball rolling on from a company culture to actually get your engineers to write. So I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, so there's a bunch of things here and I, I probably should write about this. I've, I've mm -hmm. advised companies on how to do this and I've spent a lot of time on it. Um, so I think the first thing to ask is why does the organization want to do it? And mm -hmm. oftentimes it's for recruiting purposes. And so you know that needs to be a real priority for the organization in order for you to justify investment in it. Now, you know, there are other reasons to do it. Um, you know, namely, I think actually writing things is how you really deeply understand them uh, in many cases, right? Until mm -hmm. you explain something, you mm -hmm. don't really understand it. And so it can often push your thinking forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's you know, uh, other benefits for the organization. So obviously benefits for the individuals and for their careers. Um, and so being real explicit with the leadership team of an organization that, in order to recruit, we need to build a brand. In order to build a brand, we need to tell the world about all of the cool things we're doing. In order to do that, we need to do it in an authentic way, right? We need to be transparent and open about it. And we need to incentivize and encourage folks to do it. Um, and so that's the foundation. Now, the way it dies is as soon as an executive makes fun of engineers for publishing blog posts instead of shipping features, it's gone. Right. right? You know, as soon as you say this isn't this actually this is something we want to do, but if you do it, I'm going to I'm going to you know um, cast shade, right about about you promoting yourself or your or your work versus being productive. Then it can it can really easily die. Um, as long as you don't do that, you can build a really thriving approach there. It takes it takes a lot of effort and energy. So you've got it at Instacart. We would regularly have forums where people could present work that they'd done internally. You know, really valuable to educate across teams, to you know, get new ideas and feedback and to you know, build individuals' ability to communicate internally. And we would pick the best of those and, and, and push those folks to write content around them. And I think it, it, it worked for a few reasons. One, you know, I had invested a bunch of my time in writing and had shown that some of the articles could be really impactful in the community. And so people had a model they could look to that, mm -hmm. you know, this is something that can work. And two, we would keep a really high bar. And, you know, it's hard to write. It's still hard for me today to write. Mm -hmm. And so the bar was kept by having, a, you know, a series of folks that can edit, review, advise folks on writing. Um, and you can get that, you know, at your, at your own company, you can get that through your community. So I strongly encourage folks that are interested in writing to find the five people that will give them really critical mm -hmm. advice. Right. You know, after you've got that first or second iteration, you go to folks and they'll give you really thoughtful, critical, structural advice about the content, advice that hurts a little bit. Right. But then you realize, oh, when I address it, this is so much better. And now I'm even more excited about the article. You need to build that kind of review sure. in order to put out really good content. For sure. And, you know, I think um, you, you continue to do that even at your advanced stage. Um, the current blog post, for instance, has a a handful of folks at the bottom that you um, reach out to for comments. And um, obviously there's other folks in the technical system that practice similar practices. And I think it's, it's always helped me as well um, a lot. So I think those are, those are all great tips. Um, I missed a question that came in um, just relating to some of your, your, your previous comments. Um, how do you handle or accommodate a target for prediction from a different ecosystem or background than the available data? that you were trying to do effective event-based predictions. Yeah, so I think the, the, the spirit of this is in your, when you're in a system and you can't actually collect the outcome that you care about um, and link that outcome you know, to historical data in order to identify you know, and predict the thing that you really ultimately care about. So an, an example might be, 
you know, uh, how happy is the is the customer with the delivery experience? And there's so much bias in collecting any kind of feedback from your customers that you're going to end up missing uh, a lot of that information, and you're not going to be able to predict it. And so, and there's you know many many situations where where this happens. And you, know, I always think about a a funnel of you know there's the final uh, perfect piece of data that I would love to have that if I had it. You know, I would I would have the the perfect information about the event, and then you just need to step back from that and you know think through mm -hmm. well what are the causal factors that might lead up to that, what are things that would just be very strongly correlated with it, um, and uh, oftentimes this is where the power of A/B testing comes into play. You back away to the things that you can measure that you think are causally related or even just strongly correlated to the outcome that you really care about. You build models to predict those, and then you A/B test them to see how well they actually perform. Um, and you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a more concrete example. One of my favorite problems at Instacart was, um, you know, when should we deliver the groceries? It turns out, if you deliver the groceries right on time, right? Right the last minute before the hour ends, the customer is as unhappy as if you were five minutes late because it feels like it's late and like they're, they're tense about it. You actually have to be there five minutes or 10 minutes early. And so when we were predicting uh, driving times, we wouldn't predict the average driving time or predict the variance of driving times. We would predict a quantile of driving times. What's the, what's the time that we think there's a 99% chance that the driver is going to be able to get to this delivery location. And we would then say, okay, we want that 99% chance to be five minutes before the end of the delivery window. And then we would tune those parameters using A-B tests to figure out, well, is 99% right and is 5% right based upon how customers actually give us feedback. Mm. Mm. Got it. Yeah, that's a that's a great example. Uh, very helpful. Um, so so I want to kind of move forward in the in the timeline and um, you started a company a few years ago, um, Anomalo, and um, I'm thrilled that, that I'm a supporter and an investor um, from, from the early days. Um, but I wanted to sort of understand uh, and, and ha give you the opportunity to share with the community, because um, I believe that there's a key insight that exists behind every company, every startup. Um, so, so what was the key insight that led you to start Anomalo? Yeah, so I think it's two key things in combination. You know, one is the awareness of what was happening with the technology ecosystem uh, around making it incredibly easy for an organization to now capture every scrap of data flowing through the organization and then democratize access to that you know, throughout, throughout everyone. And we saw this happen at Instacart. And when you have that two-sided you know, situation of now there's this huge diversity of data flowing in you know, near real time into a platform that anybody in the organization can query, build products and analytics on. The surface area for quality risk goes up exponentially there. Um, and so at Instacart, we would constantly have you know, data that would be you know, late, missing, corrupted, um, you know, have unexpected changes in it, and it would have lots of downstream consequences on decisions that were made um, fire drills that were created to investigate why something happened, or even machine learning models going wildly off the rails because they were being fed, you know, bad quality data. Mm -hmm. And so I, I knew that this was a problem that was going, every organization that was going to be data-driven was going to face this problem. The second insight was the existing approaches didn't work. Um, and the, the predominant existing approach is, let's just write a bunch of rules about our data. Mm -hmm. The uh, you know, time that the grocery order is delivered you know, must be after the time that it was picked up from the grocery store. Seems obvious, right? You can just put that rule into place. Instacart had a system that, that allowed us to do this. Anybody could go in and write a SQL query that would express one of these rules. And we would assert those rules about the data. And when I left, there were thousands of these in production. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have high quality data. It wasn't, it wasn't a fixed problem that didn't solve the issue. And it didn't solve the issue for a variety of reasons. The, the main one is that data is just so much more complex and ever changing than a lot of other things that we've thought about monitoring. So I like to compare it to, if you wanna test your code, 
you can write unit tests that will you know, definitively test the logic in the code. And you can have pretty good coverage of your code with unit tests. Or if you want to monitor your infrastructure, you know that the CPU utilization on the database should not go above 60%. And you can use your intuition and understanding of how the database works to set a monitor and control there. Data, data is like huge, right? It's, the, it's, this, it's this reflection of everything happening in the real world in your organization. And it's influenced by third parties, by developers, by data transformations, by operational changes, by humans going in and doing things. There are so many sources of change and chaos flowing into this huge, massively multivariate system all of the time. Rules are never going to cut it. It's, you're never going to be able to write all of the rules that would cover all of the edge cases. So we constantly found ourselves fighting these new unknown unknowns, right? The next data quality issue was always something we hadn't thought to write a rule for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you do write all of the rules, good luck maintaining them, right? Mm -hmm. Because the product is going to constantly change. The data model is going to change. You have to reevaluate those rules every time. Um, and if you try to auto-generate them, you're going to get, start getting a huge number of false positives because the data isn't something that you, you can't computationally go in and figure out what all of the rules are. And many things just don't have an associated rule for them. For example, something could be null 10% of the time, but that could vary you know, dramatically. It could vary seasonally. It could vary with other factors. And so mm -hmm. you can't put like a hard constraint around that. And so we realized that you should be able to use machine learning to understand and quantify the drift in data arriving you know, in real time into data warehouses and, and be able to solve this problem in a much more scalable way. And so that was the kind of product insight you know, to solve the, the problem of you know, scale and diversity of access. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so obviously rules um, in, in your view don't scale um, completely, um, but I know that you support them in Anomalo. Um, so you have sort of both this machine learning brain that's looking for meaningful deviations, um, statistical deviations across a set of data. Um, plus you have sort of a, the marriage of a rule-based system um, for areas where the client or the customer um, really sort of demand that or, or know, you know, convincingly um, sort of what they need to see. Um, so you've, you've decided, if I understand correctly, to sort of merge both of those ideas uh, into one product. Is that fair? Yeah, actually there's three, Pete. So mm. there's what we call unsupervised learning, which is, you know, I've got a table, I want to monitor it for adverse changes. And just, I'm going to let the algorithms track changes in that data. Then there's what we call metrics monitoring, where a user is specifying a specific metric, could be a data quality metric, like the percentage of time mm. on this null, or it could be a business metric, you know, how often is my delivery on time? and be able to segment that metric you know, by geography or product type or type of API event, right? And monitor those metrics for unusual changes. And then there's validation rules where I'm setting mm. some hard and fast constraint about the data. And oh. what we realized at Anomalo, actually we began the company building the unsupervised learning, the machine learning component, the really mm -hmm. kind of novel deep IP. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredibly powerful tool, but it's not enough. It's not a complete product. Uh, in order to really do modeling well, to do data quality monitoring well, you need to support all three of these. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we've built. And the way that they work together is the unsupervised monitoring gives you like a base layer of coverage. And so we have customers that have tens of thousands of tables being monitored with Anomalo. And you can just light them all up. And we've made these machine learning algorithms be um, very, very careful about never producing false positive alerts. So they're only looking for the types of changes that we know are adverse changes. Things like you know, suddenly having duplicate data where you did not have duplicate data before, or um, you know, a significant increase in null values uh, in a location. So mm. uh, you know, they're constrained at really adverse types of changes. Um, and they work really hard to control for the amount of chaos and background noise in the data. Mm -hmm. So we use machine learning algorithms to essentially search for potential data quality issues. And then we validate those data quality issues by issuing additional queries and getting a longer time series history of that data in order to validate that this isn't a uh, holiday change that's always expected to happen as an example. So that is like your base layer of coverage. I like to think it could get you to you know, 60, 70% of the mm. value of data quality monitoring. 
Um, the metrics are an incredibly important, you know, additional component here because sometimes you care about specific data in the table a great deal, right? So if we go back to Instacart, you know, I cared a great deal about that delivery time. And so I really wanted to pay very close attention to that. And I wanted to see how that changed by market and, you know, by type of shopper. And so with an anomalo, it's really easy to specify a SQL query that says, you know, here's my time series structure. I've got a date column. I've got these, you know, five metrics. I've got this segmentation strategy. Anomalo will build time series models to monitor all of those metrics for unusual changes. Um, and so that way, uh, a subject matter expert can point Anomalo to say, I want to really closely watch this specific slice of this data. Mm. Then the validation rules, they still play an important part because the validation rules is the only way that an external user can bring their knowledge of the real world, of the way the app is architected, or you know, the way users are supposed to engage with the product and make assertions about that in the data. And so a common example would be, what if a column is already null 5% of the time? Our machine learning algorithms aren't going to alert on that. They're going to only alert if that goes up from 5% to 10%. Right? It's going to alert on a change. Same thing with metrics. In the validation rules, a user can specify this column should never be null. Mm. Um, and you know, bring that external knowledge to bear on the data. And mm -hmm. so that's what we see the system being really powerful as. It's a, it's a foundation, there's a bunch of automated monitoring, and then subject matter experts can come in and bring their focus areas or their uh, subject matter expertise and express them as rules on top of what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. Yep, got it. Um, that sounds super, super interesting and, and powerful. Um, and I know that um, you guys have spent a lot of time sort of from a product perspective, not just, you know, from the back end engineering, monitoring bits and, and, and pieces, but when it comes to like putting these three sort of views of data quality or monitoring um, into one product, I imagine that's a little bit challenging to sort of intuitively explain to a, to a customer, to a, a user of the product, um, all in one UI. Um, do you have any, any tips or thoughts on how you're successful in, in accomplishing that? Yeah, so I think one, one important part of that is the fully unsupervised. We've made a conscious decision to not allow users to make any changes there. They begin with like factual configuration about the table, like how is time measured in the table? When do I expect mm -hmm. this data to arrive? But then all of the fully unsupervised monitoring is completely automated. The models are rebuilt every day um, and you know, they're gonna catch you know, issues one time and then not alert on them again because they're constantly being rebuilt and there are no knobs and dials there. Um, and we've worked really hard to prevent those from ever, ever sending false mm. positive notifications. So mm -hmm. you know, we could have gotten into, I think, a lot of trouble if we made those highly configurable, customizable, and lots of mm. knobs and dials, mm. uh, because users may not fully understand how they work and can end up shooting themselves in the foot um, or missing issues. And so you know, we work really hard to take problems about data monitoring, like I'll give you an example. A lot of data and financial services never arrives on Saturdays and Sundays. And so a naive system would say, hey, the data is missing today. Mm -hmm. um, and or is it, a, is it a holiday? Is it a bank holiday? holiday bank holiday, right? the data might yeah. not arrive. Yeah. The naive systems would send you false positives. Um, uh, a, another system might require the user to go in and enter that information. right? Uh, but a lot of users, will, they won't know that or they won't think about that as they're configuring the monitoring. They won't enter that until they get the false positive notifications and are already mm -hmm. frustrated by them. And then will they know that that's where they need to go to enter it? Instead, we do a model that predicts the inter-arrival of data. And we'll learn that the data never arrives on holidays or never arrives on weekends. And so that's actually OK. And we don't need to send a notification. And so we work really hard to make that unsupervised part smart mm -hmm. so that it can scale without a lot of change. And then we have a very simple UI for users to come in and add metrics and add the validation rules. And the way I like to think about that, Pete, is you know, there's about two thirds of that functionality is no code, right? I just am going to do three or four clicks and I can monitor a metric by a segment or three or four clicks and I've got a specific validation rule, you know, from a menu of a bunch of options. But then the last third is very technical, highly configurable. You're, you can drop in and write complex SQL. You can control you know, new machine learning algorithms that are applied to specific data. Um, mm -hmm. You can make, you know, fine tune tweaks to how 
these checks are working. And so what we find is that customers get this base layer of coverage they don't have to worry about. Lots of subject matter experts can come in and use the no code part. And then the, the real deep data science, you know, analytics professionals that live and breathe their table, right? That, that they, they, are, they are critically dependent upon that fact orders table, right? For, for a lot of what they're doing. They can come in and use the full set of features and functionality to express almost anything that they want around you know, what, what about this data is important? What do I want to be notified if it changes? What are my expectations about this data? Got it. Well, I love how you've it sort of um, considered the surface area of the product to support uh, everyone from you know, low code, sort of probably business users or, or perhaps data SMEs um, all the way down to folks who are more technical. Um, I think you also have an API, don't you, for sort of direct interface from orchestrated data jobs. Um, to talk to us about that. Yeah, so you know, the exact same API that serves front-end requests in our product, we expose through you know, a pip installable package. Um, and you, know, you can also interact with the API in other classical ways. Um, and that API you know, allows you to do everything that you could do in the UI um, you know, through code or configuration. And broadly, we see three different types of activities happen in the API. One is configuration. So you know, I'm a new customer or I've added a new data warehouse or a new team and I've got a thousand tables that I wanna set up monitoring on. Um, I can use the API to programmatically control that configuration. Um, or you know, if I wanna have a, uh, you know, a hook in my CICD process such that anytime a new data model comes into existence, I wanna set up monitoring on Anomalo, that can be fully automated. So that's the configuration piece. The next piece mm. is the execution of the checks. Um, and so this is interesting. We actually designed Anomalo to be an independent platform watching the data. It's, it's like back to the Dr. Seuss, who's watching the watcher, um, you know, kind of a, a comic, the bee watcher mm. watcher, right? You, you don't want to have your airflow DAG be responsible for monitoring the data if a part of what you want to monitor is whether or not the airflow DAG completed. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's actually helpful to have an independent orchestration system, which is integrated into Anomalo that's observing the data, watching for it to arrive. And so you don't have to, to, to you know, orchestrate things yourselves. By default, Anomalo takes care of it. But there are times when in your DAG, you want to change the behavior of what you're doing with the data based upon the results of data quality. So you know, if I find a material anomaly in this data set that I was about to publish through reverse ETL to some partner that I care about, um, you know, I, I want to I want to stop the processing, and mm -hmm. you know, immediately get somebody on call in order to address that issue. Or I want to quarantine bad data. So when our checks fail, we'll give you you know SQL that'll allow you to quarantine the bad data and you know, move on with data that is good. So that's where we we see the orchestration layer um, and the ability to execute checks being really important through the API. The third piece is getting data out. Oftentimes you want to do an integration with your data catalog, or you have an internal tool that you want to use to show you know, what's, what's uh, healthy in your data warehouse. We've added a lot of these visualizations dashboards within Anomalo. So increasingly our customers don't even you know, want to do that or need to do that. And in case they do, they can get all of the data out of the platform through the API. Got it. Got it. Very cool. Um, well, I, I want to you know, talk a little bit about data quality inside an org and take a little bit of a step back because obviously, um, you know, through a product such as this, you've um, discovered sort of lots of constituents um, across an organization that potentially need to collaborate on data quality. And so um, I think we're all learning as an industry that this is not just the domain of the data engineer or the DevOps person, right? I think in your article, you talk about, well, that's just like asking the, the factory, um, you know, operator in a factory um, to check the quality of the materials coming through the machine. That they, they, they only sort of watch the performance of the, the machine itself. They don't actually check the quality of the goods coming, coming through the machine or being processed by the machine. That requires a different sort of expertise. I thought that was a particularly good analogy. And I think that gets us to this notion that um, you know, it, it takes a village probably to, to sort of establish data quality inside your company. Um, talk to us about that and who you see as the, the main players um, in, this, in, in these scenarios. Yeah, it's, it's a really important point. And it takes a village for two reasons. One, because different people are going to have different understanding of even what should be tested, why and how. Mm -hmm. 
But also when things go wrong, you need to make sure you've got the right audience reviewing and triaging that, who's going to be able to understand, well, is this a, is this a real issue? And if so, what do we do about it? So the constituents that we see there, there is the data engineering um, or you know, increasingly analytics engineering, um, which is depending upon the organization can range from you know, responsible for infrastructure and for the movement of data through to actually creating you know, more complex and rich data sets and you know, having more subject matter expertise about the data itself. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of varieties of, of, of roles there. So that's one constituent. They tend to care a lot about is data arriving on time um, is the volume of records what I would expect? Are there any obvious missing segments? Is the schema appropriate, et cetera? The next constituent is what I would call the data scientist, the analyst, the machine learning engineer. These are people who are real data professionals, right? They live and breathe the data. Their job revolves around the data. And they will tend to have very deep, close relationships to specific mm-hmm. sets of tables mm-hmm. in the data warehouse. They will intimately know and understand the structure and content of this data. And they're the ones that are gonna go in and add you know, really complex rules, validations, metrics. They're going to consume you know, some of the most complex machine learning uh, identified anomalies to understand are they meaningful or adverse mm-hmm. for their teams. Then you have what I would call data savvy professionals in the organization. These could be a product manager evaluating A-B test results, right? And wanting to understand is the A-B test, uh, is there some difference between the population? Right, and is the A/B test set up, and is the data flowing correctly, so that they'll be able to make decisions off of it? Um, it could be somebody in operations or in marketing, right, making decisions using data. A classic example at Instacart, we had people that would launch physical markets, you know, decide what zip codes in Cincinnati should we support with Instacart. They were critically dependent upon data because we would collect every time a user came to the website. They would put in their zip code to identify what stores they belong to, and of course, we would want to launch the zip codes that people were putting into the website, right? Because they want the service there. And so that was a critical data pipeline that directly informed those folks. At one point that data pipeline stopped getting updated and it got switched to something else. And they were still doing SQL queries on the old one such that they were launching data, using data that was six months out of date. Mm. Um, And one of the biggest growth changes at Instacart during our tenure there was just fixing that (laughs) so that they could use the right data. Um, So you've got, you know, those three constituents, data engineers um, and uh, analytics engineers, data scientists, or kind of you know, folks that are really dedicated to the data and then just folks that are using the data to do their job. And what we found is um, uh, using uh, Slack, Microsoft Teams, and creating dedicated channels for narrow topics of data quality is really powerful. And so mm-hmm. most of our customers, they'll have sort of from five to maybe 50 you know, different topical channels. You know, uh, at Instacart, you might've had one just related to catalog data received from our uh, you know, retail partners. You know, another one related just to logistics data about delivery times, right? Another one related to utilization of shoppers. Another one related to customer satisfaction data. Um, and within those channels, you'll have all of the people within the organization that have a vested interest participating in that channel. And then within the data quality monitoring platform, you wanna be able to route the alerts and the responsibility of the data and the resolution flows in through those channels. And so that provides the visibility in the organizational structure. Um, It's more about the the kind of topic of the data and the subject matter expertise than necessarily your role. Mm. And so talk to us what happens after that, because I know that you're a proponent of thinking of um, data issues in sort of a triage, um, you know, format. Um, How do you like, how do you see successful teams responding to a data incident? Like what, what does that entail and what should that entail going forward? So I think the first thing, uh, and this is a failure with many approaches, it was a failure at Instacart, is it's not enough to tell you that there are you know, five duplicate records in table X today, mm-hmm. or that column Y you know, mean you know, shot up by 20%. It's actually pretty annoying to get alerts where that's all of the context that you have. Mm, mm. And so the first thing that we realized with Anomalo is visualization uh, and context around these issues is is critical. And so we've really architected the engineering of Anomalo and the the platform itself to make it really easy to create visualizations that are interactive and super customized and relevant 
to the nature of the issue. So we probably have a hundred different types of visualizations that can appear in the Slack notification to help explain the issue. And we work really hard to go inside the data itself to help explain it. And so as an example, if we suddenly find that there's 2% you know, of values in this table are null, well, you can go in and you can look at the records and kind of scrub through the records and squint at them and try to figure out like, why are these null values? Why are they there? What, what characterizes them? Is it something about the location? Is it something about the, the timestamp? Is it something about you know, this entity or this relationship? Like, and you can go blind trying to do that in part because mm -hmm. you actually need to compare it to good data, right? You need to have some reference to be able to say, well, why is this data different from the other good data? And that's very hard for a human to do. And so we build algorithms to do that in an automated way. We call it a, a root cause analysis. We scan the entirety of the table and identify any segments that are strongly correlated with the bad data. And we just provide that directly to the person consuming the alert. And so you know, why I'm, I'm, I'm harping on all of this is because if you're getting alerts and those alerts don't come with context and require you to do a lot of work to understand the issue, it's really painful and you're gonna end up ignoring them. Right? If instead they come with context and you can quickly say, actually, this isn't a big deal. I expected this to happen. Or I understand why this happened. It happened because of X and we've already got a fix in, you know, in progress you know, uh, to solve that. Or this is totally unexpected and it's happening in a place that's actually really serious. And I'm pretty sure my CEO is going to email me about this in three hours. Wildly different, right? If you, if you get that information in just a minute, instead of requiring the consumer of the alert to do three hours to do that, I think the whole game changes. So, you know, putting the right actionable information in the context with the alert is like the first mission critical thing. From mm -hmm. there, you need to have a triage system. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, within Anomaly, there's this concept of, uh, there's all the data that you're not monitoring. There's the data that you're monitoring and it's healthy. There's the data that you're monitoring and something has failed, something has gone awry. And then there's a subset of those that you actually need to take action on, right? Something needs to be done there. There are a serious issue that requires some work. And then there's the ones that are actually been resolved and now you know what the issue uh, is and you've resolved it. And so Anomalo is really about helping you to get into that triage state of, is this something that I should be paying attention to? Um, am I investigating it? Um, or have I decided that it is an issue and I've now handed it off to the appropriate team? Mm -hmm. And so we call that you know, triage where you can acknowledge or you can hand off. And the handoff would be you know, creating a, a pager duty event if you know, somebody on the infrastructure team needs to respond to something or creating a service now ticket for you know, uh, someone to negotiate with the vendor why the API changed and get you know, the engineering team uh, through a JIRA ticket to make the change to actually reflect the new API, right? So that's where the actual work happens. And so we see, we see Anomalo as being, let us help you understand, is it a real problem? Where did it happen and who do you need to talk to? And then get that next set of, of discussions happening through the appropriate system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes you realize how many considerations there are in building a data monitoring system. And it's no wonder that um, orgs with their cobbled together SQL scripts, you know, just don't scale um, over time. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. Great, well, um, Jeremy, we're almost out of time, um, but I just wanted to ask you, you know, sort of a founder oriented question um, because we have lots of founders on the show who are, are equally great technical professionals. And um, I'm wondering, you know, for you as a technical person, as a data scientist, former CTO, um, what, was the, what was the most challenging part about starting a new company as a technical founder? Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, there are all sorts of technical challenges you know, behind the scenes that are really mm -hmm. fun. Um, mm -hmm. you know, some of them are, can be quite difficult. Uh, you know, the, the one that, that gets me constantly is just how, how much variation there is in the, uh, the exact implementation and SQL dynamics across the different cloud data warehouses. So building a system that's going to execute arbitrarily complex SQL across all of the different data warehouse providers mm. and work mm. at scale. And mm. all of the edge cases, it's just, um, you know, this mountain of edge cases because we could be working with healthcare data, we could be working with financial services data, identity management data, um, it could be in BigQuery, Snowflake, Athena, uh, it could be in Presto, it could be in Azure Synapse, um, you know, so many different edge cases there. Um, so as a technical challenge, that's been something that's been recurring uh, is, you know, how do you, how do you really effectively solve that? Um, but I think that that pales in comparison to the overall startup journey, 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and the ups and downs of it. You know, mm -hmm. this is this is um, you know uh, well known. But as a founder, you'll have uh, a, a day where it's like everything is amazing. This is fantastic. I'm so excited. Things are going so well. And then the next day, it's like everything is falling apart. Mm -hmm. You know, well, why did I ever decide to do this? And so mm -hmm. being able to manage your energy through that, especially when searching for product market fit. Uh, I think was really, really uh, challenging. It was a very it was a great growth experience. I really enjoyed it, um, but it was quite challenging. And, and uh, you know, the opportunity to wear lots of different hats and have real accountability and ownership for things, I think, is a fantastic experience. So, you know, overall, it's it's an amazing thing. It is it is a very tough thing to do, though. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, yeah, th thanks for your honesty there. And um, I know it's uh, quite a road to be a founder and there's lots of folks in our community who aspire to, to do the same. Um, so if folks want to reach out to you and get more information um, about Anomalo um, or chat with you about any other data monitoring questions that they might have, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so if, if they want to reach out to me, uh, Twitter is probably the best place to, to find me and communicate with me. Um, I'm on Twitter at Jeremy Stam, so J-E-R-E-M-Y-S-T-A-N. Uh, and if you want to reach out to us at Anomalo, you know, just go to our website. It's A-N-O-M-A-L. Oh, shoot, I messed it up. I knew I was going to do that. It's A-N-O-M-A-L-O dot com. Great, awesome. You can go there and reach out to us. I think uh, we spelled it right in the YouTube description. Yeah, so um, you. folks <laughs> folks should be able to, to find you there. Yeah. Um, well, Jeremy, this has been really fun. Thanks for chatting with me today. And, and thanks for all your contributions to the community over the years. Yeah, thank you, Pete, for having me. And thank you for building this great community. It's, a, it's an amazing asset for everyone to learn from. So really appreciate it. Awesome. Um, and to our listeners, we'll have another DC Thursday coming up in two weeks on the 5th of May with Neha Pawar from the Apache Pino project. So don't forget to subscribe um, so that you're notified when we go back on the air and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in.